Hello again guys and welcome back to another Big Al Devlin video here at the House of Devlin and today I want to introduce to you um, the, my pride and joy in regards to my sword collection. I have a number of different swords, axes uh, and daggers um, that are both um, antique, uh, you know, very from antiques uh, uh, all the way up to sort of uh, film replica swords um, but the mass majority of my uh, weapons and swords that I possess um, are um, modern day replicas of historical weapons. Um, I've even played my hand at making my own um, Dane Axe also, which I do have a video series on here um, uh, if you're interested in seeing this. But this sword here is beyond and above all the others in my opinion. It is my pride and joy. It is an absolute pleasure to be sharing this with you and this gives me goosebumps every time I look at it and even when I just hold it, it just, it is the most beautiful blade that I've ever really sort of come across. That, that certainly, my, as I say, my own possession and I'm just so very proud of uh, 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 having it. And this is a 1796 pattern British infantry sword. Okay, so it was made in 1796 for um, a British officer uh, who would have fought in the line infantry um, um, of the uh, British armies at the time. Um, so it's from the Georgian period, the late uh, George III period, I believe, uh, if I can remember my dates correctly. Um, and this was the sword that infantry officers in the British army would have used exclusively um, during the Napoleonic Wars, which started in, I believe, I've got it written down here, let me just double check, um, it was 1806, was it? No, 1803, even earlier than that. Uh, so the Napoleonic Wars began in 1803 and lasted to 1815. And this sword, as I say, was built in, uh, or forged even, in 1796. So it's a very, very old blade, you know, it's over 200 years old. Um, it comes with its original scabbard. So I'll just give you a close-up view of it to start off with. Okay. And it comes with its original scabbard with brass fittings, brass and leather fittings. Um, regards to the blade itself, um, it replaced the old 17... Uh, uh, 86 pattern which was the previous pattern of sword uh, and later became replaced uh, by the gothic hilted sword in 1822 so it served quite a long period of time as um, a, as a primary blade for British officers okay it is known as a type of spadroon blade so if I was to draw it now out of its scabbard I've got to be do, do this very carefully because as you can see, the scabbard is badly, badly damaged. It has suffered a lot of battle damage. Um, in some ways, a lot of people will be like, oh, they want pristine condition um, of uh, antiques and stuff like this. And I can see why they would want that. You know, I, I would not disagree with that. But the fact that this sword has suffered a lot of damage... <laughs> You can you, you can tell that this sword, and certainly by its scabbard, as I say, has seen um, a tremendous amount of battles in its time. Um, and this sword, I have a you know a letter of authenticity um, proving one, it's an antique, but secondly, that it is actually a sword that was utilised in the Battle of Waterloo. Um, now, a spadroon blade is a blade that looks very, well, looks like this. This is, a, this is a spadroon blade, as was its predecessor. It's a straight edge blade, okay, uh, at that lengthwise comes somewhere in between a very short stabbing blade and uh, the longer broadsword. Its primary function is to stab, but it is just as uh, uh, just as good at slashing and cutting also um, but its function is to stab um, uh, and thrust towards the opponent but have the as I say the flexibility to be able to uh, be swung also and to be swung very easily this is an incredibly light blade if you look in contrast to how I'm handling this uh, very easily um, in contrast to for example my uh, film uh, uh, 
Fabrica sword, uh, the Kurgan's blade that I recently acquired also, you will see the difference in how I have to handle that and the way that I can handle this. This is a proper military weapon. This is a type of sword that they used on the battlefield. Whereas the Kurgan blade, which as I said, I will be putting up um, at a very similar time period as this review, um, is a blade that is you know, made for a film. <laughs> it's not the type of blade that you would very much see in any period in history, unless you were an, an absolute giant of a man, and even then you'd probably be hesitating using it, and you would probably just use just a slightly oversized standard longsword. Now, we're going to look a little bit more detail at the, at the blade itself. Now, that is a blue tint to the blade, okay, which you lose up here, okay, which is, um, I assume, because this end of the sword has been used more, um, but also because it's got blue and gold uh, uh, filigree um, pattern uh, and gilding on the, uh, the, the, the sort of uh, uh, hilt side of the blade. Okay, um, and so that bluey tinge that you see is actually the blade itself. It has blue and gold um, put into it. Now, I don't know if you'll be able to read this, but that says, or maybe on the other side, it's a little bit easier sometimes. Oh, I do apologize, guys. It is very hard to see, especially in the wrong, so if you've got to get the light right. But on here, there is written for my country and king. And these sort of patches here, that's not dirt. That's damage from musket balls, believe it or not, as was confirmed by the antique stealer. So this has been um, sh been used, as I say, within line infantry. And the, the officer, the individual who used this weapon, um, was shot at. And I don't know if he was hit, but his sword certainly was. Um, as I say, it has confirmed usage within the Battle of Waterloo. After that, um, uh, the officer who used it um, is... Uh, no longer confirmed as uh, serving in the army. So he either died during the battle or he, um, you know, retired, <laughs> I assume. One of the two, okay? Um, as I say, the blade itself is completely, it's, it's beautiful. And I was saying it's a spadroon blade, which, as I say, it makes it means that it's, it's straight, um, either single or double edged, but this one is single edged across this side where my fingers are going down at the moment. Um, and uh, as I say, it's somewhere in between that of a short stabbing sword, like it, maybe like a gladius, for example, uh, and a broadsword. So it's sort of in between the two, okay? Um, other features that the sword possesses, um, it has a very simple guard uh, and uh, um, uh, hilt, okay? And that is on purpose. That is because it allows for um, ease of use, okay? Um, the whole purpose of this sword was to make it as light and as quick as possible and to make it as usable as possible so that the soldier could fight for as long as possible um, and with finesse and skill. Um, uh, beyond that, however, the guard is still substantial enough to protect the hand. Um, as you can see, it's got a double brass uh, element here to the hilt, protecting the hand completely from downward strokes of, the, of another sword striking down, protecting the hand, and it's got finger guard here also. Okay, One extra feature that the sword also incorporates is the guard, the brass guard. One side, it's only just the one side, flips up. Now, the purpose of that is so that when it was uh, in your scabbard, you would place it onto your belt and the guard is not in your way. Whereas if it was up, it would be against you and it wouldn't be able to be sort of, you know, lie properly against you. So being able to put that down or up, whichever way you wish to see it, um, allows for a nice tight fit around the belt area when you have it um, within its scabbard. Now I'm going to put it back into the scabbard um, and hopefully it goes in properly. There we go. Um, the scabbard has a very tight fit. Um, that's one thing I've noticed about scabbards with antique weapons that I possess um, is that they 
um, are very tight fitting. Um, they they grip like like an old fashioned glove. It, you know that saying fits like a glove comes from the fact that gloves typically are very tight around the hands. They're like a second layer of skin almost, and the scabbard is no different for a sword. Okay, um, consequently, getting you know, if you, you know, when you get a replica weapon, often, more often, not the scabbard is often very loose and uh, and, and very ill fitting in, in some respects to allow you to obviously put the sword in and out with ease. However, this was obviously the scabbard itself designed to contain the sword and not to come off, and so that's why it grips it so tightly. Um, as I say, because the scabbard itself, you actually want to see that, you've got lots of these little uh, hoops, uh, which would, of course, be allowed you to tie this um, effectively um, to your belt, or in which, whichever manner, of course, that the, the troops in that period of time would have uh, holstered their, their swords um, on themselves. Um, and regards to some extra details, if you look at the the pommel as you can see it is decorated and it's got a wire handle okay so that's a wire that goes around the brass element of the handle without obviously i don't have to tell you that this is forged steel <laughs> and also as well as that full tank that would be you know it, that that's just standard when it comes to military weapons and antique weapons they were built to to last they were built to be used and used effectively and not come apart during the battle. And so um, I hope you enjoyed seeing my prize to possession. Um, I am absolutely in love with this weapon. I love the history behind it. I love thinking about the officer who would have wielded it during the Napoleonic era, or the many officers if it of course passed hands, but the fact that it was used in the Battle of Waterloo, which for being British myself, is such a pivotal uh, battle um, during the Napoleonic, Napoleonic era, essentially it ended the Napoleonic Wars and saw Napoleon Bonaparte exiled or, or killed, uh, uh, you know, eventually he, he died, I think two years after his exile. Um, it, it was a pivotal point. Um, and it, you could explain, could explain it as this is, this sword is one of the many con contributors um, or contributors even um, to the fact that England still speaks English um, and doesn't speak French. <laughs> it was a, a very important um, battle for us to win. And the fact that this was part of it just makes it me in awe of it. So you can probably tell I'm, I'm kind of stumbling over my own words because I'm in awe of this weapon and its history and the people who would have wielded it very bravely during those pivotal battles in the past. So thank you guys for watching. I do apologise if I've not given you any, you know, complete details. The hardness rating of the sort of steel and things like this, I don't know. I don't know any of the specifications as such. Um, but uh, I just really wanted you to see the blade um, and enjoy it. And if you know you want more details, I can measure the blade off, obviously, for you, weigh it, things like this. Um, but you know, when it comes to antique weapons, they all th these were made sort of in batches essentially so there, there would be maybe some small differences between one sword and another but um there wouldn't be that many differences okay so um the, the their stats will be out there on the internet without any doubt um but uh anyway i hope you've enjoyed this video i'll see you soon